This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery, and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight's show is a little different from some of the other ones uh, I've had on. Anyone who listens to the show regularly knows I, uh, I kind of lean away from the extraterrestrial hypothesis when it comes to UFOs. But that doesn't mean I completely discount it. And one of the subjects we've never really dealt with on the show, other than in passing, is that of hybrids. So tonight, I have the co-author of a book called Meet the Hybrids. His name is Miguel Mendonca. And one of the hybrids, or one of the women who believes she is a hybrid, um, Charmaine. I found this interview very interesting, and uh, I don't feel like, as again, anyone who listens to this show realizes I, I don't feel like I ever have the, um, the right to doubt someone's story. I wasn't there. I don't know what happened to them. So, barring some obvious level of deception, which I don't think there is here, I tend to believe the stories at face value. Now, the interpretation of the stories can be taken a lot of different ways. So, it's not so much, did this happen to them, but what was it really? Maybe it is extraterrestrials. Maybe I'm overthinking it. I don't know. Uh, But I found this interview interesting. This was conducted a couple of nights ago. And I feel that one way or another, there's something to this. What it is, I don't know. Perhaps it is extraterrestrials. They certainly seem to feel that it is, and they're the ones having the experiences. Maybe it's something entirely different, as we've suggested many times on the show, wearing different masks for different occasions. I don't know. All I know is it's a mystery, and uh, yeah, here we go. And uh, Miguel, you're the co-author of the book, correct? Correct, yes. And you are one of the people that uh, they talk to in the book, Charmaine? Yes, yeah, I'm one of the hybrids. Okay. All right. Um, and who is the other co-author? Barbara Lamb, um, who is a uh, a therapist of, of many stripes, um, particularly uh, over the last quarter century. Um, she has begun to work with uh, people in uh, hypnotherapy and regression therapy, um, past life regression therapy, who started to come to her with experiences with extraterrestrials. And some of these experiences included past lives as extraterrestrials. So she began to dig into this um, increasingly over the years and then was at, I believe, may have been the UFO Congress um, some years ago. And uh met a woman there who she she just found particularly striking looking and uh and this lady said you know what what is it what are you looking at and she said well you know i hope you won't mind me saying but you remind me of a hybrid and that woman was cynthia crawford uh who is uh one of the hybrids uh we talked to in the book um who responded yes i am a hybrid and they began talking and became uh, firm friends. And uh, down the line, um, Barbara had begun to meet other hybrids to research the subject through the stories that were coming to her through her clients of uh, being abducted, having all kinds of contact experiences, including experiences where they were being taken up onto ships 
and were having sperm and eggs removed. And then some of these people would later find themselves back on the ships at night and be presented with uh, babies who were half ET, half human looking. And they would be, particularly the mothers, would be encouraged to hold them, to give them energy, uh, to create physical connections with them. Um, and Barbara then began to present this material at conferences. I had had a lifetime of interest in this subject. Um, I had been writing a novel about uh, truth in our time and, and the, the need for truth at all levels to be spoken in our time. And uh, I started to dig into the black projects uh, for background research on a particular character to look at the truth in that subject because I'd had my own sightings and contact experiences. And so during that period, I came across Barbara's work, Barbara's lectures on hybrids. And so I, I ended up getting hooked on this subject, very, very interested, very stimulated by it, and felt a very strong emotional connection to the subject for reasons I'm still unclear on. Um, and so I started to write a novel incorporating hybrids, and I wanted to talk to Barbara uh, about this because I wanted to get even more detail and insight if I could. Um, and from there, uh, we began to connect, to talk, and uh, she told me that there was a group of hybrids um, working with a group of experiences and uh, other quote-unquote regular people uh, who wanted to help to bring this awareness out to the rest of humanity. And I was particularly stimulated by this as I, you know, I'm a former um, environmental campaigner. So automatically it's it sort of put me into this kind of strategic uh headspace and i started to analyze the idea of hybrids bringing their information out into the world and looking at how best to do that and and i i concluded that one of the most important things to do was to kick off with uh an evidence base collect um, collect their testimony, their stories, their experiences, their understandings, um, and ha give them control over the process in that they get to speak their truth um, without being uh, in any way um, sort of set upon, if you like, by the kind of cynical mindset uh, that would just you know, want to rubbish their experiences. So I suggested to Barbara, well, let's, you know, pull a book together in which these guys are able to speak their truth. And then um, then from there, um, you know, there is a series of steps that I anticipate will happen. And one of those has already come to pass, um, being the... Uh, co-presentation between Barbara and six of the hybrids at this, this year's International UFO Congress, um, of which Charmaine was a part. Okay, and how, did, how was that received? Really, really well, yes. I, I was, uh, you know, a little bit apprehensive because obviously it's, the subject is not something that uh, normally gets discussed, you know, even at UFO conferences. So uh, it was really, really good to to go along and for each of us to have a little bit of time to just speak about us personally and how we feel that we're doing our missions here on Earth. And it was just great to have people come up to us afterwards and, you know, say thank you very much for sharing your information. And, you know, we, we can uh, sort of sympathise. Some people had had similar experiences, so it, it gave them the opportunity to realise, you know, that they're not the only ones out there going through certain things. 
and everyone was was very very positive so it was a fantastic experience and i'd never been to america before so it was uh, very nice for me to to visit and get to know the american people and uh, travel around a little bit and yeah it was a fantastic experience okay and um well i i guess let's start with this when you say you're a hybrid what what does that mean to you well for me i'm a reptilian hybrid so i'm partly human partly reptilian uh, you know, and the reptilians have had a lot of bad press uh, over the time, particularly with people like you know David Icke and and, and so forth. So you know, for me, uh, there was there was slightly a little bit of that uh, at the conference that you know we understood that all hybrids are are bad and evil, but you look okay. <laughs> uh, and that you know, for me, that's part of my mission is to get people to understand that you know hybrids are very nice people and we all have our missions and we're we're here to help humanity and particularly with the reptilians not all reptilians are bad you know we're not all out to take over the world i'm certainly not i'm here to help humanity not not to hinder it so uh, so it was it was interesting that by giving people the opportunity to to meet me and actually you know spend some time with me and, and ask me questions that whereas their opinion had been quite negative against reptilians that you know giving them that the opportunity to just spend some time and, and speak to me their you know their mind changed for the better so that was that was nice because that's part of the reason why i'm here <laughs> okay um at what point in your life did you did you real did you start considering yourself a hybrid well i suppose it was uh younger in in life when i was a, a teenager I'd, I'd done partial changes and what i mean by that is you know my eyes changing or my skin texture changing. I'd always had experiences, i.e. I'd always been visited by ET species. Uh, you know, when I was a child, I just thought that was a, a normal thing. I didn't realize <laughs> that it didn't happen to everyone. As I got older, obviously I realized that, you know, not everyone had these, these sorts of visitors. Uh, so I, I was a, a little select with who I discussed it with. Not, you know, it's not your usual thing that you go to school and say, oh, by the way, last night, <laughs> Uh, right. So when I sort of got to early adulthood, um, I have a, a team of reptilian uh, ETs that work with me and I always communicate with them via telepathy. And I'd had suspicions, you know, mostly due to the partial changes that I was a hybrid. And I'd asked them, you know, can you confirm this in, in, in some way? You know, I, I would just rather know, am I or am I not? And I had an experience where um, they abducted me and, and took me off and, uh, you know, very, very nice experience. Uh, I feel very comfortable when I'm with them. There's, you know, there's there's no fear or, or jeopardy there. And I was taken to, to a cave um, and the reptilian said, you know, OK, you've, you've asked us this, this question. You would like confirmation as to whether you're a, a hybrid or not. And so they gathered around me in a circle and put their hands on me and they assisted in me changing into my reptilian form. So for me, that was confirmation enough that yes, I, my suspicions were correct and that I, I was a hybrid. Okay. Um, how much of this stuff did you remember prior to being regressed hypnotically? That particular experience, I, I remembered uh, very clearly, um, and I remembered being in, in my reptilian form for uh, approximately five hours uh, and communicating with them and walking around in that form and just sort of getting familiar uh, with that form. So, so I had a complete recogn recognition of that event. Um, yeah, some of the other events uh, to do with the military was was more what was uncovered during the regressions with Barbara and Mary Rodwell. Okay, all right. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to listen to you talking about this and just think you're absolutely nuts. Oh, of course, yes, yes, I'm prepared for that, yes. <laughs> Um, what what makes you uh, think that they're extraterrestrial and not just maybe appearing that way? Okay, well, I mean, for me, I've I've had a, a lot of experiences, as I say, you know, ever since a, a child, uh, with various ET species, uh, you know, also military and, and secret society. But perhaps we'll we'll get into that later. Yes, I understand. You know, some people will think, well, you know, 
how, how can you absolutely certainly say that it is whichever ET race, you know, greys or reptilians or, or, or whoever. I mean, for me, having had so much experience and visitations and abductions with these species, for me, there's absolutely no doubt. And you, you know, you have a sense, everyone has that, what some term a sixth sense that you, you know, if something happens, you know, if it's right or if it's wrong, or if there's any fear factor. And, and for me, there's absolutely no doubt that the ET species that have and do visit me are just that they are ET species visiting me um, with the military. When I'm visited by them, it's, it's a completely different feeling um, and you're treated in a completely different sense. And the same with the, the secret society. Okay. Well, I, I guess what I mean is that, you know, we have cases of hybrids and changelings and stuff going back through history um, prior to the, the UFO uh, let's say the UFO idea mm -hmm. back when it was fairies and things like that. And uh, I mean, from my experiences and from what, what I see, I don't see much evidence of an extra, of an extraterrestrial as much as an alien intelligence. That's not uh, maybe appearing to us as what it is. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm wondering how, how other than just, what they seem like, what else convinces you they're extraterrestrial rather than, say, interdimensional or something else entirely? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good a good question. I mean, you know, for for me, I'm, I, I pick up very much on, on energies. So, you know, for example, it, each species, when they come and visit you, they have a very different energy to, to each other, and it's a very different energy to let's say, a, a human energy or an animal energy. So for me, over the years, I've just, I've come to know and recognise them instinctively. Uh, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, yes, that they are ET in, in origin uh, because of being very familiar with their, their energetic signature, if you like. Okay, all right. Um, how would you, uh, and either of you can, you can can answer this one, what would be the difference between, say, a hybrid and, like, uh, what Jenny Randall's called star children or what people call uh, indigo children and so on? Do you want to go first on that one, Miguel? Um, well, this is a question that I am increasingly concerned with. Um, <clears throat> in the research for the new book that I'm doing, um, I am, and just because of my own journey, uh, I'm really starting to wonder about this because when I first began this project, um, you know, the idea was to come in as a as a virtually invisible, respectful social scientist, and I came out of it wondering, you know, what my true nature might be, and that's a mm -hmm. hell of a journey, and I'm now wondering. Uh, how I can how I can best pull together research which explores the question of what all humans are, because I'm very concerned with this this issue of awakening of activation because I feel like that's what I've gone through, um, and is that because I'm an ET soul? Uh, I had this particular experience with one of the uh, hybrids recently, Juju who has been central to this this awakening every time i speak with her we have a sort of uh weekly date where we get together on skype and hang out and talk and explore things and and every time there's this crazy revelation um which kind of peels back another layer of all of this and i said to her you know with all of the experience that i've had the things that have happened to me the sort of the energetic reaction I have when I'm around anybody with kind of ET energy, it really sends my energy through the roof. It really has a very strong effect on me because I don't have any stimulants of any kind anymore. I don't have uh, caffeine. I try and avoid sugar. So I'm very aware of when my energetic state changes. And throughout the research, um, throughout the book, you will find re uh, references over and over again to 
hybrid's been here to shift the uh, the frequencies, to raise the frequencies, raise the energetic vibration of this planet towards ascension and to trigger awakenings. And I realized in one moment of epiphany talking to Juju as I was reporting to her this energetic response, this awakening to my own potential nature, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm the embodiment of the mission. And that's a heavy thought. That is weird when what you're trying to do is keep your feet on the ground so that you can talk just as easily and comfortably with a skeptic as a believer, you know, if you want to divide people that way. Um, and it gets harder. It gets harder every day because as these things start to trigger in me, as these things start to develop, I guess my understanding of where the hybrids are coming from has increased and my appreciation for what they've been saying and setting out is developing from the inside. And as that happens, um, you know, I, I mentioned this to Juju and uh, and I said, well, do you know anyone who you think might be psychic enough to pick up on what my nature might be? Is there some answer that I can get to this, some clarity? And she said, well, if you ask 10 different psychics, you'll get 10 different interpretations. So the best thing to do is to ask yourself, go inside for that information, because you already know, you've just got to allow it. Um, you've got to explore that for yourself. And um, she said another another way, you know, if, if you want to ask, uh, your guides can can assist with that. So you can ask them, as you're falling asleep at night, uh, could you give me a word or an image that I can remember um, that will help me to understand who and what I am? Um, so in my response to that, I started to explain how I'd always felt uh, on this planet among humans, how I had thought about related to the idea of ETs, etc. And then this very strange thing happened. I, I felt my body kind of almost slump, kind of almost slumped to the side um, as if something had been switched off. And it was as if somebody was using my mouth as a loudspeaker. And out of it came this very clear line, I have the soul of a wanderer. And it came with like this clap of thunder in my solar plexus. And, and I have only had that, that response when in the presence of a major truth. So that forced me to uh, explore this idea of wanderers. Um, I looked up uh, um, some books on the subject. I started to read Carla Rukert's book, uh, Wanderers Handbook. And in that, at the beginning, there's a uh, questionnaire um, scored out of 100 in which anything above 75, um, in her view, you have an ET soul. And I scored 85. And hmm. that was, I guess, one of those moments. I mean, I always think, I always take these things with a pinch of salt because um, I'm never 100% sure of anything in particular. Um, but I remain open. And so in the ensuing period, as I started the interviews for the new book, I've been asking this question, are we all star seeds? Are we all hybrids? Are we all star beings? Or are some people just absolutely regular humans? I mean, I think all of this goes into what is our true history? And that, you know, is a, is a gigantic 48 hour nonstop conversation all of its own. <laughs> all right. Um, Charmaine, you want to, you remember the question? Yes, yeah. I mean, okay. I've, I would uh, sympathize very much with, with Miguel there that, you know, really, 
who knows how much of, of humanity are actually, you know, partial ET genetics, you know, and then if, you know, if you're sort of open to that prospect of, of some or all of humanity having partial ET genetics, then you, you know, you've got the whole factor of, well, there's very many ET, you know, species. So, you know, people could be part human, part one ET or three parts ET and one part human genetics. So, so I mean, it, just thinking about that is, is sort of, uh, you know, quite mind boggling. I, I realise, you know, for some people that would be quite a leap, especially if the whole hybrid subject and ET subject in itself is something that someone is not very receptive to or doesn't know very much about, to then start to consider that a, a great portion of, of humanity or all of humanity is is partially uh, ET genetics, then, uh, yeah, that that's sort of quite a, a mind bender, isn't it? Okay. Um, is, is there anything that you've ever had done that, um, like DNA analysis or anything like that, that you can, that you can show people that says, okay, this is unusual in some way? No, I, I haven't as yet. I mean, I, I, in a, in a previous interview that, that did come up. And as I said, on that occasion, I am open to the prospect of, of doing that. If anyone has any specific details on uh, places that might do that, uh, yes, absolutely, I would be open to the prospect of, of doing some sort of DNA testing uh, or other types of testing. Uh, I know some people have suggested um, bone density testing. Uh, I'm not quite sure where they go, where they're going with that, but uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yes. I'm so I am open to that, but I haven't done that as yet. Have you ever been able to get a picture of you uh, transforming in any way, even in minor ways? No, I, no, I haven't. I mean, when I've done partial change, it's it's a, a very curious thing because sometimes you'll you'll do a, a partial change, especially when I was a, a child, uh, and. To a certain extent, you you wouldn't notice that you've done a change, which I, I realise for some people might might sound rather odd, but when when you're just changing into another form that is still naturally your own, as well as obviously your your human form is naturally in your own, you you don't really think anything of it. It's it's not abnormal to you. It's abnormal to the people around you or the people who witness it, but to yourself, it's it's not abnormal it's just natural uh so when i was a child i wasn't always aware of you know for example my eyes changing it's just something that happened and because it felt very natural and normal uh, i didn't consider it uh, an odd thing so no i haven't uh, i haven't taken any pictures as yet okay all right um a lot of people, I mean, if they hear the, the term hybrid, they're probably, if they've, if they've been researching this stuff for long enough or reading about this long enough, we'll go back to Bud Hopkins and intruders. Um, and before that, really, the only mention of it, you know, it goes back to fairy, fairy lore and such with changelings and things like that. Um, but in those stories, they were always, um, the, the hybrids were always on the ships. They weren't here. So... Um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question. W what is your origin, and is it different from what people were experiencing when they see children on a ship or during an abduction? Yeah, I mean, you know, for for me, um, you know, I was I was born and and created here on Earth, but yes, you know, for for some other hybrids, I you know, if, if people have had hybrid children. Um, then you know a situation of, of visiting them either on on ship, so the those hybrid children do not come to Earth. Um, I have my my own set of hi hybrid children, um, which are not not with me. There at various other places. Three of them are, are on a, a military base. So yes, for some some people, their hybrid children they they will just visit them on board a ship. Uh, rather than have them with them, or some people indeed don't get to visit them at all. They're, they're aware of having hybrid ch children. To refer back to what Miguel was was talking about earlier, with uh, some cases of of people having their eggs taken or their sperm taken, mm -hmm. and then the hybrid children are, are created. And sometimes those people do get access to the children and are encouraged to have a, a relationship uh, of sorts with them and nurture them and spend time with them. 
uh, and other people do not get that chance. Uh, sometimes they never get to to meet their children or, or have any interaction with them. Okay. Uh, did your did your mother ever have any weird experiences? She has. Yes. Uh, I'm hoping Barbara Barbara Lamb is coming over to the the UK this this summer. So um, I've been encouraging my mother to have a regression session with her to perhaps uh, you know get to to the basis of uh, possibly what might have happened while she was pregnant with me. Because yes, there have been um, some odd uh, circumstances that have, have happened. My my mother actually had been told prior to to finding out that she was pregnant with me. She was told that you know she was not allowed to you know not able to have any more children so from her mind she had two children at the time anyway and was told that she couldn't have any more children and and so in her mind that was that and then you know some miraculous thing happened and uh she found out she was pregnant with me now you know okay that there could be a simple explanation to that or perhaps there's there's another explanation she could have been abducted at, at some point but doesn't have recollection of it uh and at that point perhaps you know i i was put into her womb and hey presto she become pregnant so but yes yeah, certainly something we would both like to you know to look into more and, and hopefully barbara will have some time for a regression and and possibly we uh, we might find out a little bit more about that Okay, all right. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Miguel and Charmaine. Where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to wheredidtheroadgo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, and we're talking with Miguel Mendoza. 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 Oh, I keep leaving that N out. I am really sorry. Uh, and Charmaine, I'm not even going to try and <laughs> pronounce your last name. Uh, and the new the new book here is Meet the Hybrids: The Lives and Missions of ET Ambassadors on Earth. Um, you've mentioned the military a bunch of times. Uh, what role do you think they have in in your life in the, in this whole hybrid scenario? Well. I mean, uh, as I've said previously, I've I've been having experiences and, and visitations since a child, you know, since I can remember. And they were always uh, very positive experiences. And when I got to, to being a teenager, uh, the experiences I was having started to become slightly negative. And uh, as I sort of got into my later teenage years, I then started having visitations from the military. Now, to begin with, I, I didn't have a full understanding as to why this was happening. I was having a lot of missing time. I could remember partial things about the experiences, but not everything. And as time went went by, uh, I, I managed to sort of uh, work out a bit more of what was happening. I had some regression sessions, uh, first of all, with, with Mary Rodwell and, and then with, with Barbara Lamb. And what appeared to be happening is, uh, so far as the military is is concerned, um, I was actually part of their, or am part of their breeding program. So I have three hybrid children that I'm aware of. Uh, these three are on a UK military base somewhere. Uh, a very limited contact. Uh, on occasions, I, I am allowed to go and visit them, but you, it's very much uh, you're observed. Uh, I'm never allowed to be alone with the children. Uh, I do remember one occasion um, I, I was pregnant at the at the time and I was taken to the military base. I remember waking up in the military base, uh, being in a very sparse room. There was a nurse there and, I, you know, I was just asking her, you know, where am I and what's going on? And she said, I, you know, I, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to tell you. So I kept persisting because obviously I, I was wanting to know where I was and, and, you know, why I'd been taken to this place. And. 
And I, I guessed it was a military situation because previous uh, experiences I had, it, it was a similar looking room, you know, very sparsely furnished. And and she said, you know, you, you've been brought here. All I can tell you is you've been brought here. Something's going to be taken from you. Now, because I'd had suspicions about being pregnant anyway, you know, immediately I thought, OK, they're going to take the child. Um, I remember someone else coming into the room with one of those sort of uh, medical smocks on and a mask. And I remember being drugged. So I, I briefly sort of blacked out at that point. And then I remember waking up and the the doctor was still still there at that point and he had something in his arms and he turned quickly and left the room so in in my mind it was it was very clear that yes I had been pregnant and and they had taken that that child um, so the military influence has, has been happening for some years now um, at, you know and being part of the the breeding program, that I'm aware of, I have three children, but it's quite possible I, I have more than that. But I've been made to to not remember, you know, those those circumstances. And, and how much of that were you able to remember without hypnosis? Any of it? Yes. Yeah, I could recall some of it. Uh, and then after the, the hypnotherapy session, um, I was able to sort of access a bit more memory of actually being with the children. Um, so, for for example, I I remembered being taken into the room where where the children are kept. Uh, the children have never been allowed to to leave the base, um, and again they're continuously monitored. And it's very much a a situation where they're they're in training. So the children will be used in the future for military purposes you know to go on missions and things like that because of their abilities as hybrid children they they're very useful to the military okay um i'll, I'll hit you you with this this one first miguel um what what do you what are you taking away from this that the mission of the hybrids is why why are there hybrids um i guess that depends on whether we're talking about uh them being the product of uh, service to self ETs or service to others ETs um, in that uh, the work of David Jacobs um, I think principally uh, analyzes the activity of the service to self ETs those that are here um, for their purposes they've you know no real uh, interest in in our uh, well-being. Um, it's about them and their needs. Um, whereas uh, our research and that of uh, Dr. Christiane Kiros, who did a study very similar to ours, um, although uh, somewhat, somewhat narrower, um, uh, she did that 16 years before us and I, I became aware of that about a month into the research for the book. Um, and her conclusions were almost identical to ours. Her findings, um, uh, the type of people that she connected with, um, she interviewed six North American women, um, and, and their, their take on things, their understanding, their stories were almost identical to what we found from, uh, eight and eight different people uh, 16 years later. And that is the way it seems to break down. Now, the service to others ETs, I think of as kind of cosmic missionaries that have already gone through their own ascension process, their spiritual evolution, and are here to assist uh, humans in going through their own. But this place seems somewhat contested and and how all of those ets relate to one another um i don't know that's not something we we got into uh in the research but i think that's broadly what's going on so the uh these kind of missionaries are here creating hybrids which are a kind of stepping stone a bridge to the ETs themselves, so they they can mediate, they can go between, and 
And as I said, this business of uh, awakening, of raising vibration, I've actually experienced it, and that I never saw coming. Um, even though I realized that, the, you know, when I got into the implications of what's going on in here, because I had no idea, I'd never heard of ascension, uh, I'd never, I'd heard of it, but I'd never paid any attention to it uh, previously. But the hybrids all talk about love, unity, connection, oneness. Um, it presents as an entirely benevolent enterprise. And the hybrids themselves are, I'm just, I'm still slightly surprised, slightly taken aback um, by the consistency in their, in their words, their deeds, their spirit. I watched um, the DVD yesterday of the lecture at the, at the UFO Congress when the hybrids uh, gave brief presentations at the end of uh, Barbara's uh, lecture. And, and it is extraordinary to listen to these people. Um, the messages that they have, the spirit they have, the bravery that they have, given the fact that our culture still hasn't been able to handle the fact that humans come in different varieties. I mean, the levels of, I mean, look at the whole, the whole Black Lives Matter thing was unfolding during the research for this book. And you're talking to people who are saying we're part extraterrestrial, not part of something not even of this world. And then you turn on the TV and black people are getting shot dead every day by the cops, it seems. And you look at almost any kind of inter-community relationship. You look at the way the Middle East is ripping itself apart and you think, oh my God, A, this place is not remotely ready for this, but B, it is absolutely crying out for it. Okay. Uh, Charmaine, uh, you, you can address this either from your viewpoint or an overall viewpoint, however you, however you want. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's very interesting. I, I, I completely uh, agree and, and resonate with what Miguel just, just said, that in, in some respects, humanity is not ready for this, but in, in some respects, it's crying out for it. And, you know, the thing is, is, is yes, there's always going to be people out there that are going to ridicule or doubt or disbelieve or say that all us hybrids are, are mad, we must be. And, and the thing is, is, you know, when, when you're in this uh, position of, of being honest about yourself and who and what you are and trying to help people, to a certain extent, you, you will always experience ridicule. But for me personally, I know I'm here to help people and so I, I have to I have to just accept that there's going to be negative as well as, as positive. And for me, you know, for every hundred people you have saying, Okay, you're mad or I don't believe you or whatever else or all reptilians are bad, you know, whatever whatever their, their standpoint is, for every hundred people saying that, then maybe one or two or three people that you help. And it's those people that need your help is is why I'm here and why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and why I've kind of gone public, if you like, because it gives the people who are having experiences. I, I run my own support groups in the UK for people mm. who are having abduction or encounters or people who do suspect that they are hybrids and also people who, who are having sort of negative experiences with military and, and secret societies. You know, and for me, that's it's it's very rewarding because you're getting people who are coming along and you can actually turn around to them and say, I can sympathize. I can understand, you know, your fear and what you're going through because I've gone through it myself. And, you know, if, if you can come at it from that that point of view and, and people realize that, you know, OK, you're, you're not you're not just someone there listening or you're not just someone there you know, sort of playing the, the, the counselling role, you can actually say, I've gone through it as well. And, 
you know, people start to realise, OK, I'm, I'm not mad. There are other people who are going through this. Uh, and, you know, for me, it's it, it's very rewarding. So for all the people you, you have that are negative, uh, for me, the most important thing is is to get out there and, and help people. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'm trying to remember everything you said in the chapter. You, ha you have some abilities, do you not? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, all us, us hybrids uh, do. So, I mean, for, for me, uh, I've always been into healing. Uh, so I do healing work and I, I run healing courses. Um, the counselling and regression I'm studying at, at the moment. So I'll, I'll be qualified soon. I'm also nutrition therapist and I do emotional freedom technique as well which is very very useful for people again who are having experiences and that fear factor uh, I notice particularly people going to sleep they get into a wrong cycle of obviously they're afraid of things happening so uh, they'll end up not wanting to sleep at night so that's that's very good for for dealing with with the fear also uh, abilities such as uh, being able to read people's minds now that's not for people to panic. It's not something I do all the time because I'm very respectful of, of people and I wouldn't intentionally go into someone's mind if they wouldn't want me to. Um, yeah, so go, going back to the, the healing, um, a lot of people have, have found my voice to be uh, very healing. So uh, some of the clients I've got, if they've got problems sleeping, I've recorded my voice. Um, I'm doing my own uh, sort of uh, meditation and relaxation uh, series. Uh, because people have, have said that that's sort of quite healing to them, so I'm going to be doing that. Uh, also, being able to see people's health issues, um, see into their body or see into their auras, um, which aids me in, when I do my healing work, which is yeah, which mm. is quite good. Okay. Um, now, you also mentioned secret societies. You want to get into that briefly? Yes, of course. Okay, so the, uh, the secret society, um, I, I had an experience where uh, I was abducted from my home and I don't have any re recollection of the journey to wherever this place was. I do remember waking up in the room and uh, this gentleman was there, black robe with the black hood, so I, I couldn't see very much of his face. And he explained that he was from a secret society and he was inviting me to join. Um, at which point I started asking various questions such as, well, who are you and what do you do and what, you know, what type of role are you expecting me to to do in the secret society? Um, he very much did not want to answer any of my questions, but was very adamant on wanting me to join. Uh, when I sort of didn't turn around and, and say yes and, and continued asking him questions, he became very aggressive. And I said, well, no, I have I have no intention of, of joining your society, um, at which point, you know, again, he was very angry and, and left the room. Uh, he went out into uh, a bigger room, which was sort of a half half moon shape. Uh, on one side, you had tall windows and uh, a sort of a platform uh, that was raised. There was four high backed wooden chairs. He went to sit on one of them and there was three other gentlemen that were sitting sitting on the other chairs and what become very apparent is that uh, there was other people in the room uh, something was about to to happen some sort of meeting was was taking place uh, and I thought well that you know this is this is very odd why you know why am I being allowed to be present for for a meeting um, a being was brought into to the room uh, I, I don't have I've not had uh, connections with this particular ET race, so I don't have a specific name for what they're called. Uh, their skin is uh, sort of a black and red in colour. Their eyes are, are yellow and red. He was brought in uh, to speak to these four gentlemen that were sitting on the raised platform. And he was asked to join the, the society, uh, to which he agreed. And he was taken out of the room. And uh, most of the people were leaving by by two doors and at this point uh, a reptilian being walked into one of the doors uh, through one of the doors and instinctively I, I recognized this reptilian as being my son and so we 
had communication. We went in, into uh, to one of the rooms off of this main room and uh, was just talking. Um, I hadn't had much contact with my son up to this point. So from my point of view, I, I was really quite pleased. Although in, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, this is this seems a bit of a set up situation because obviously I've I've been brought here against my will. I've just been asked to to join the society to which I've refused. I've been allowed to witness this what would be a secret meeting. Um, I, I'm being allowed to be aware and, and remember this. Uh, I didn't know if I would remember all of it uh, when I was sort of taken back home. And then my son shows up. So it, it seemed a very instigated situation, but I thought, well, I'm happy to see my son, so I'll, I'll go with it for the time being. Um, later on, I, I was taken into a, a, another room, which was circular, and again, was presented to these uh, men in the black robes with the hoods up. I very much uh, had an uneasy feeling at this point because they were all standing in a circle uh, holding candles uh, it, and it was you know visually it, it was very much it, uh, ritualistic so at that point I was somewhat concerned thinking okay what's what's going to happen now uh, the black and red being that I'd seen earlier on uh, was brought into the room and we were both brought forward uh, towards the gentleman who who had spoken to me previous to that you know uh, and approached me and said you know we want you to to join the society and I'd had uh, a very strong sense of the reason why they wanted me to join the, the society was for breeding purposes so again as the military have me as part of their breeding program it seemed that the secret society wanted me as part of their breeding program so what took place then was basically a, a, a ritualistic rape. So um, the black and red being was was ordered to rape me, which then took place. And the purpose for that was creating a child. So it seems that, you know, regardless, I had previously said, no, I, I have no intention of being part of your society. Uh, they had chosen to ignore that and you know, they wanted a child, and so that's it, they were going to have one. Um, so after that was over with, um, I was taken into a room, and, you know, obviously I, I could clean up and everything, and I saw my son again, uh, and then was drugged, and the next thing I remember was waking up at home. Um, to my knowledge, I've had no further dealings with that secret society, so whether it's a case of they've got what they wanted i.e a child uh, and that's it they're you know they're not interested in anything else or perhaps other things are are going on but i'm not being allowed to remember now, now do you remember that at all uh spontaneously or was that a, a re uh through hypnosis i do remember some of that uh scenario yes and when i had um a regression with Mary Rodwell, the, the last regression I had with her. Uh, I, I remembered going into the room and the, the start of the, the ritual, but I, I didn't remember all of it. And then after I'd had the regression with Mary, I could then uh, recollect the, the full uh, ritualistic rape scenario. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, fr from my point of view, Obviously, you're you're very angry afterwards because you're you're being taken against your will and you're being sure. used in a way that obviously you, you would not like to be used. Uh, the the child that was created, uh, as far as I'm aware, I've had no contact with that child. So you know, so again, I mean, that's that's the whole other subject matter that you know children are are being created. No, you know, not just with me, with other people as well. That children are being created and that you have. No, no access to them. You you have no idea of where they're being kept or how they're being used. Um, you know, so far as the the children on on the military base, obviously, they are going to be used for for missions. And obviously, it's it's a difficult thing because how how do you get to them? And even if you knew where the children were and you actually went there, you, you, you know, you're one person on your own that's trying to instigate something or or get them out which you know which you you can't you're one person against a secret society or you're one person against the military 
Now, this incident with the secret society happened before or after you came out as a hybrid publicly? Before. Okay. Um, I guess the, the, the one other thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, you do have implants, right? I do, yes. Yeah. And you think these are military as opposed to extraterrestrial? I do, yes. Yeah, so I, I have uh, one implant in my nose, which is a, a tracking device. So at, at any point, if they want to see where I am, then they can, they can track me. I've also got a, another implant that the military have put in, which prevents me from fully changing shape. So I can't fully change into my reptilian form. I've got a, another implant, which is, is basically, it, it monitors um, any sort of chemicals in, in my body, and it can also instigate uh, them being unbalanced. So things like serotonin and, and melatonin levels, for example, they can control. Uh, which, you know, anyone who's sort of into that side of things, if, you know, if you can control the, the serotonin and melatonin levels in, in someone, um, yeah, that has quite an effect on them. So, yeah, so obviously their experimentation of me is something on, ongoing. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't sort of put those types of uh, implants in. And obviously to put a tracking implant in me, they obviously want to, you know, to keep record of me and know where I am you know, any moment of the day. Have you ever had uh, tried to get them removed? I have, yes. Uh, I've got a friend who um, is very in, into energy work uh, and he's been working to, to see if sort of energetically he can interfere with, with the implants. Now, we did have a partial success in that, um, in which uh, after an energy session, he did manage to turn those off. Unfortunately, uh, about a week later, they were switched back on. So uh, we're trying to work out at the moment how we can sort of permanently either either remove them or, or switch them off. Another sort of unfortunate thing is, is with the implants, if you can accurately locate exactly where they are, even when you try to remove them from under the skin, it's they can either bury themselves deeper or again if you achieve in in actually removing them obviously you know you, they can be re-put in so it's it's a bit of a difficult situation even if you achieve switching them off or removing them entirely you know within a week they could be back in again hmm. all right um miguel uh how many people did you interview in this book eight eight okay and and what else can people find in the book besides the interviews? Um, well, um, I think that is really, you know, for a lot of people, the core of it, um, right, because right. it's going to be new to them. Um, it is a hell of a journey. Um, I've gone through that book um, because I had to do the transcription, uh, most of the writing, uh, the editing, proofreading, more editing, the formatting. Um, so I have read that book cover to cover at least 20 times. And <laughs> every single time I found new understandings, new, uh, new moments of crystallization where I would suddenly get it, different things would hang together. And uh, I mean, the first part of the book is just a sort of introduction. Um, you know, we walk people through, sort of uh, get people warmed up to the idea of hybrids by examining hybrids in human culture. What hybrids have we created? What hybrids uh, have come to exist naturally um, within the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom? Um, then we look at hybrid discourse in ufology. How has the subject been handled up till now? And this principally has a comparison between um, the, uh, well, I mean, we look at what different people have set forth and then compare and contrast them. And uh, then we have the core of the book, part two, uh, the interviews, um, and that's, that's getting on for 200 pages, um, getting into real depth and detail. Um, but still, you know, every time I talk to any of them, I'm learning new things and thinking, oh, my God, we didn't even get to that in the book or that or that. <laughs> um, and then part three is a thematic 
comparative analysis um, where we take, we break down all of the questions and compare and contrast people's responses, looking at, because I was really keen to understand um, to what extent people's understandings and experiences um, and opinions uh, intersect and overlap. I wanted to create a kind of Venn diagram to see if we could look at the core of this to understand what are the uh, the commonalities and what are the differences. I think the differences are principally which races um, people are composed of, but the commonalities is pretty much everything else. Is pretty much the abilities, missions, services, um, that that people provide uh, it's their understanding of what this is about it's their spirituality um, I guess another area where things are somewhat different are the methods how they are um, how they're created a number of them uh, some people don't know uh, some people understand that it was uh, that ET genetic material was introduced um, post conception. So while they're in the womb, that material was introduced. Um, and then uh, Robert Fullington has, I think, about four uh, different possibilities. He doesn't know, but there's some very interesting possibilities that arose in his research into this and you know opinions that were offered to him by other hybrids including um i mean the wildest to me is that uh, because he's related to the mantis beings and they're they're ancient beings who have been around for as long as any other um they don't they've kind of conquered death they're kind of you know cause them masters of time and space they they don't have any kind of constraints you know that we could relate to um they don't they don't even die in a way that we would understand they can simply select a new form so it may be that um that is how he was created and then because um i mean there's a very strange twist to all this he met through uh the institute for human cosmic interaction um a group dedicated to um, establishing, uh, I suppose, uh, friendly relations with ETs. Uh, we could put it that way. Um, he met another of the hybrids in the book, uh, Jacqueline Smith. And when they met each other for the first time, they never heard of one another, as far as I understand. Uh, and when they met, their jaws just fell open because they recognized each other from the ships hmm. and and then they they had uh very interesting interactions for the, the period of time that they were um at this meeting um and I bet. spontaneously at one point did this mantis bow where they have this particular this particular bow that they do to one another and they said it just happened spontaneously between them and and it just freaked them out to see the other person doing it because they'd never seen another person in human form doing this and uh uh Jacqueline described it as a soulful joy because you just can't share this with <laughs> regular people if you like um and Robert related that story to another hybrid who's um, much further down the road in their understanding of things. And that person said, well, you know, it is possible that if you met Jacqueline on the ships and given the age difference, it's possible that you have some of her genetic material and you're actually related to her because you mm. both have mantis DNA, etc." So um, in terms of the methodology, how these means are created, um, yeah, that differs and the beings that they come from, but the rest of it, the kind of sense of mission, um, just the vibe of these people, it, it's just different. 
it just is different. That is, there is a humility to them that is genuinely, genuinely otherworldly. It it astonishes me over and over and over again that that these guys never never shift in terms of what they are. I don't know if I can explain that any better than that, but with humans, generally there is a hell of a lot of complex game playing going on, and we all know this. We Everybody does it. We are constantly uh, having to adapt ourselves to our circumstances, to our company, um, oh my goodness, I've just studied this all my life. I've just watched it in people. I've seen it in myself. I'm just fascinated by all of this, which kind of is part of, I guess, what fits with this whole wanderer thing that I'm uncovering. Um, and I always had a uh, this idea buried in my mind that I wanted to write a book about an ET that had come here to study humanity. And I feel like I'm understanding better why that is <clears throat> because I've always been doing that. And, and so I, I am a student of human behavior and the hybrids just don't fit. There is something absolutely otherworldly about them in the nicest possible way. <laughs> All right. Well, the book is Meet the Hybrids, The Lives and Missions of E.T. Ambassadors on Earth. It came out in December, right? It came out in mid-December, yeah. Uh, that's 2015 for anyone listening to this way in the future. Um, if people want to get a hold of you or, uh, I mean, I don't know if Charmaine, if you uh, talk to people publicly or not. I do, yes. I've, I've got a website, which I can give you the website address, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's the typical www.galactic hyphen federation dot co dot uk so people can visit the website email me through that and contact me for any services and there's details of all courses and and services on there okay and miguel um well we set up a website uh which is meet the hybrids dot wordpress dot com and on that each of the hybrids has a uh has a page with some information about them and there's a contact form uh, and we set that up so that readers who want to connect with particular hybrids, ask them particular questions, connect with them for whatever reason, um, you know, as long as it's respectful and, and positive, um, they can email them directly through the contact form. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I thank both of you for spending some time with us tonight. And uh, what's up? What's up next for you? Um, personally, I'm already uh, about half a dozen interviews into the research for uh, the new book, um, which is, I guess, uh, of course, I don't want to give away too much at this stage, but let's say it's a natural outcropping of the hybrid research, and it's looking at the whole subject of ufology through that lens, I guess, asking, um, you know, what we've learned in 70 years of ufology, picking, you know, uh, Roswell next year as a point in time, uh, looking at what the implications are, where, where does the field go now, and how do we connect this better to the mainstream, given the implications discovered in that research? All right. Well, again, thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Charmaine. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. All right, there you go. I'd love to hear what uh, you people think on this subject. And uh, at some point, I plan on putting a forum on the website. I haven't had time to do it yet. But uh, there will be a forum eventually, and uh, it'll stay up if people use it. So you'll be able to comment on different things, and uh, maybe we'll take a note from Skeptico and queue up a question at the end of every interview. We'll see. Also upcoming, we're working on, uh, I'm working on collecting some artwork designs for some merchandise, some uh, mugs, some t-shirts, maybe some hats, things like that. And of course, you can help us out by becoming a patron of the show. 
And uh, you can find that at wheredattheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month. You get some extra stuff throughout the month. Uh, early interviews when uh, they're available. S- extra snippets here and there. And, of course, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. 